Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I am your host, Joe Hollywood. And once again, I am joined by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And wrong way, Andrew Walker. Wrong way. <laughs> there are so many, so many questions I have. <laughs> None of them legal. <laughs> Tonight's episode, Death from Above. Uh, we did a recent uh, podcast about car crashes uh, in, involving celebrities and uh, famous figures. Uh, so we're going to sort of keep the uh, planes, trains, and automobiles theme going, and we're going to talk about plane crashes today. Um, some of these we've touched on a little bit on past podcasts. Uh, we did an episode months ago called the, the day the music died and yeah. where we looked at musicians and stuff. Um, and so we're going to kind of re, uh, recover some of these, uh, stories from the past, but, um, but we're going to try and keep it within the theme of plane crashes. Um, Andrew, I think you had mentioned earlier in a text that when you when you google celebrity plane crashes the list is endless and i think you've yeah. said in the past like why would any celebrity travel like travel by plane when there have been so many celebrity casualties um what are some that immediately come to mind um well it's starting uh oh, decades ago we could go with buddy holly mm-hmm. right Yep. Yeah, we're gonna delve into that a right, little right. bit later. Yep. Um that's probably one of the most famous. I didn't know this, but go through the list. Patsy Klein. Patsy Klein, yep. Otis Redding also didn't know that. Yep. Glenn Miller was a big one. That uh, was uh that was a wartime crash where he was supposed to fly across the English Channel and may have been shot down by enemy fire. Uh yeah, the guy who's gonna be our next vice president, JFK Jr. If you believe the QAnon things, <laughs> absurd. Yeah, uh, I think someone's going to talk about Carol Lombard. I don't know. They they yes. mentioned they might. Uh, yeah, I, I have know. a couple of topics that I did a little uh, dig into. Uh, you mentioned JFK Jr. That was going to be my lead subject here. Right. Um, our previous podcast, we talked about the uh, anniversary, the 60th anniversary of the JFK assassination. Uh, just a few days after the assassination, they had JFK's funeral procession, and there's that famous image of little JFK Jr. saluting his father. Uh, I had read that that was his third birthday uh, when they captured that image of him saluting. Uh, of course, he grew up into a handsome man who uh, chose not uh, to pursue a, a life of politics and went into publishing and some other things. I could only wonder what would have happened if he would have chosen uh, to run for president. I think he would have gotten elected easily because he was so damn good looking and so charming. And and there was an episode of Seinfeld where uh, Elaine uh, got to go to her workout class with JFK Jr. was hoping <laughs> hoping to uh, pair up with him. Wow. Uh, he, he ended up with the the Virgin instead. But um, he, he might have put uh, Obama. Might have given him a, a good run for his money in the 2008 oh, yeah. Democratic primary. Yeah, had he chosen to go that route, but uh, apparently he had no interest in politics, uh, at least at that time. Uh, so uh, he was more of kind of a, you know, I don't know if socialite's the right word, but everyone knew who he was. Um, Do you think he would have taken up like his uncle, uh, Ted, and gone into the Senate? Possibly. I mean, if that's something he chose to do, he he could have taken that path. And I honestly think had he run, uh, he would have won in a landslide and you just can't help but wonder what might have been. But but now when you hear the name Kennedy, you know, so many people attach the word curse to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, As a matter of fact, when I was in Dallas, someone had written, uh, written, had written sarcastically on the picket fence over by the grassy knoll someone had written in a sharpie nothing bad ever happens to the kennedys which kind of made me laugh out loud because the kennedy family has a long history of tragedy going from jfk to bobby kennedy not too long after that 
to uh, Ted Kennedy being involved in that car accident where the woman had drowned yep. and he fled the scene or something. And just when you think, oh, there's nothing to this Kennedy curse, uh, we lost JFK Jr. in a tragic accident. So the story goes, on the evening of July 16th, 1999, uh, JFK Jr., who was a relatively new pilot, I'd gotten his license, uh, piloted a Piper Saratoga to attend the wedding of his cousin uh, Rory to Mark Bailey at the Kennedy Compound in Hyannisport, Massachusetts. Uh, the plane also carried Kennedy's wife, Carolyn Bassett, who I believe at the time uh, were not on the most pleasant terms from what I read. Um, and then the sister-in-law, Lauren Bassett, was in the plane as well. Uh, Lauren was supposed to be dropped off at Martha's Vineyards Airport, and then Kennedy and his wife would continue uh, to the Barnstable Municipal Airport. Uh, Kennedy had purchased his plane three months before the crash. Uh, the Bissett sisters were seated in the second row of seats with their backs. Uh, they were facing the rear of the plane, so they're back. They were back to back with JFK Jr., uh, who was piloting the plane. Um, Kennedy checked in with air traffic control tower at Martha's Vineyard Airport before his departure. And at 8.38 p.m. on Friday, July 16th, 1999, Kennedy departed from New Jersey's Essex County Airport, uh, 21 miles west of Midtown Manhattan. And uh, piecing things together, uh, they deduced that at about 9.41 p.m., uh, Kennedy's plane crashed nearly nose first into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, on July 19th, three days later, uh, the, the vessel Rude uh, finally located fragments of Kennedy's plane using side, sand, side scan sonar approximately 7.5 miles off uh, the coast of what Martha's Vineyard. On the afternoon of July 21st, divers recovered the body, bodies of Kennedy and the Bassett sisters. Uh, divers found the Bassett sisters near the fuselage. I read some things that said they were still buckled. Uh, Kennedy himself was still uh, strapped into his seat, the pilot seat. Um, let's see. The bodies were taken to the county medical examiner's office by motorcade autopsies on the evening uh, of July 21st, performed by the county metal, medical examiner, found that all three had died upon impact. Uh, the probable cause of the crash was the pilot's failure to maintain control of the aer airplane during a descent over water at night which resulted in spatial disorientation. Uh, Kennedy was not qualified to fly his plane by instruments only. He, he relied heavily on visual orientation. Unfortunately, they were supposed to take off earlier that day, but apparently the women were running behind or something. So when they were originally scheduled to fly out at 6 p.m., uh, they actually flew out at 8.39 p.m., and other pilots said that due to haze and uh, lack of moonlight, uh, you couldn't see the horizon. The ocean, the water blended into the sky. And since he was not instrument rated, or at least instrument only rated, um, I had seen a documentary not too long ago that said the the trajectory of his plane was this spiral where he may have thought he's flying in a straight line. Mm. In reality, he was spiraling downward. Um, probably none of them sensed anything was wrong until they hit the water. I wonder if it's similar to when you don't have any instrumentation or orientation. You, you think you're walking a straight line in yeah. the desert and you realize you've been walking in circles. Yeah. Have you ever seen on, uh, on, uh, uh, what was the show? Why am I drawing a blank now? The uh, Mythbusters. Uh, Jamie and Adam would blindfold each other in a large field and say, now walk a straight line. And they would plant these flags behind the person as they're walking. And when they got to the end of the path, they would take the blindfold off and find out that they went like 180 degrees, like in the opposite direction. And, and they were like, I was absolutely convinced I was walking in a straight line and 
our minds, if you don't have visual cues, our minds are not wired to walk in a straight yeah, line. Right. So in this case, thinking he was probably flying in a straight line, and they said what he should have done was hug the coast where you can see lights of yeah. the city and stuff, but he decided to try to get there more quickly and just flew over open water, and all he saw was blackness in front of him. That was see, it. See, I never really, I mean, I, 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 this is this tragedy. I never went into the details like you did right now. Every time, in the every detail you're mentioning, just red flag, red flag. You just got your license. You're yeah. not trained to fly at night. It's a bad weather condition. You can see with your eyes, for God's sakes. Just take your Kennedy, fly first class. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and so and there's some other uh, factors that contributed to uh, the accident. Uh, they said he was stressed out because of the marriage problems that he was having, sure. uh, the late departure, which uh, had the sun go down. And here's here's something that's kind of odd. I I'm obviously I'm not a pilot. I don't know what how much your feet play a role in flying a plane. Um, but he had broken his ankle and had his cast removed one day before the crash. And so if there's pedals and stuff that you have to operate for flaps or something, uh, his doctor said that he could barely drive a car on that ankle, let alone fly a plane. Wow. So just, are we, I mean, I almost feel like you're trolling me. <laughs> I almost feel like you're trolling me. Like you're giving me all this facts and I'm going, did not one, an assistant go, sir, maybe just, I know you're going to the wedding. Yeah. I booked a private plane. It's it's good. You don't yeah. have to fly yourself. It has two engines. Yep. Two, not one. <laughs> yeah, I I don't understand the stubbornness. Like, look at someone like Harrison Ford. He had one accident where he was forced to land on a golf course, and there was another very near miss at an airport where he landed on the wrong w runway and, like, passed over another plane yeah. it's yeah, like there was a very yeah it was a close call i think at yeah john wayne airport or yeah Burbank and it's like harry yeah. man why are you so stubborn why you're not you han solo dude that's plane? special effects you're not <laughs> flying through it's like you have a death wish like stop it i mean he's in his 80s now like knock it off so i don't know why guys like jfk jr you know they got this thrill of having to fly their own plane i putting their life and on there are the plenty line. of them that do it. that you yeah. know you were talking andrew was talking about the list of people there's a list of people that own yeah. their planes patrick dempsey kurt russell brad pitt oprah winfrey angelina jolie clint eastwood and damn near all of them are trained to fly fi fixed wing and helicopters but you know i hear cases like this you know he just got his pilot's license you know i'm going to yeah. be coming up on james horner later when we mm -hmm. talk just i don't get it yeah now, of course, having that Kennedy name, uh, people start talking about conspiracies and that he was taken out. And now there's a faction that says, no, he's not dead. He faked his death <laughs> ah. and he will be the next president of the United States. And so, you know, w when the Kennedy name is attached to a tragedy like this, then people start to run rampant with speculation. But um, when you look at the facts of this case, he was an inexperienced pilot who wasn't instrument rated and left much later than he had attended. And all these factors came together where he just not it, knowing it just, where it's he was stacking up. Yeah. You're right. Every time it, all the details that you've mentioned, just stacking like this is not going to end well. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys remember the story breaking, but when, when the story broke that, you know, JFK jr. Died in a plane crash. I was like, you gotta be kidding me after the assassination, assassination and all that it's like this family is cursed. It's it's shocking, shocking what that family is And it seemed like everybody through. else had a plan for him. You know, I remember everyone saying, like, wouldn't it be great if he runs? I'm like, I, I, yeah. he's not saying that. You yeah. are. You yeah, keep exactly. saying it. Yeah. And all the tabloids keep saying it. I, this guy sounds like, um, I'm just going to run this philanthropical organization. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, when I watch Seinfeld and that episode comes up with uh, that, uh, he never appears in the show, but... Uh, He's referenced a lot in the show, and uh, Elaine was. Uh, oh, that was just, that was the. Uh, I believe that was the Master of Your Domain episode, because yeah. she was trying to keep it together, having worked out behind JFK Jr. Oddly enough, my biggest thing about remembering him is as a child saluting his dad's coffin. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's exactly. Because I, I never really got into the whole JFK charm yeah. thing. I was like, you know what? You're a Kennedy. Just live your life, man. Mm-hmm. You don't yeah. need any spotlight. Well, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was a pretty big one, uh, pretty shocking. Um, and so that's my leadoff story. Imaginos, Pete, what have you brought to the table today? We'll kind of go around the table today. Okay. I swear I didn't do this on purpose. If I feel like I'm on a streak every time I talk about something, we're talking about tragic deaths, and it should not enter tinfoil conspiracy theory. Here we go. Okay, so Dean Paul Martin, who was the son of Dean Martin mm-hmm. and uh, Jeannie Beeger, their their first son, and he was born in 1951. And this guy, for anyone that's out there, he. I loved this show in the seven in the eighties called Misfits of Science. Courtney Cox from Friends got got a start on there. Huh? I, I don't recall it. Was, that it ran one. for one season. It was phenomenal. It was a great show. I loved it. And unfortunately, he passed away. That's why the show then kind of fell off hmm. by the wayside. But Dean Paul Martin, or Dino, and he was as he was affectionately known to his family, but when his professional was Dean Paul Martin, he was he accomplished singer who his father was he would played at Wimbledon he has done acting he, you know he's he was almost like the quintessential Hollywood person he could do it all oh he's a son of royalty yeah you know he dated Candace Berg and he dated Tina Sinatra they're like oh my god Martin's kid and <laughs> Frank said this is like written, forget Camelot yeah <laughs> look at this stuff yeah there's a whole uh there's a whole uh second generation of uh, offspring from the legends right you know Nancy Sinatra uh Dean Martin's son, and uh, I've met a, on a couple of occasions um, Allison Martino, who's the daughter of Al Martino, who's a legendary crooner. So yeah, there's that uh, there's that second tier of offspring oh, of the it legends. Happens. It happens in Detroit. We we're all Detroit Red Wing fans here. At least I hope we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, Steve Eisman has three daughters. Nicholas mm-hmm. Listrom has three sons. They're like, oh my god, could you imagine? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, okay, guys, easy. That's a sitcom. Yeah, the, yeah, that would be fun. He has three daughters, and he has and he has three sons. And look what happens: the greatest defenseman to ever live, and the captain. Here's the story. The yeah, and you're like, oh my god. So anyway, yeah, I get it. Yeah, you know, you're the sons of legends, and what what happens? So, and uh, Dean Paul Martin, or Dean Paul, as as he went by professionally, he got his pilot's license at 16. So oh. this guy was an was a trained pilot, while the rest of us were like, eh, kind of kind of parallel park, oh. and he served in the California National Guard, and he was a very capable pilot by what all accounts came from. Mm-hmm. And on March 21st, 1987, at 1.43, he, he, him and his co-pilot, uh, his uh, engineer, uh, Ramon Ortiz, who, uh, who, who flies with them, um, I think his weapons officer. So the, their, their flight and two others uh, took off. And they were doing a re- regular training exercise, and it was a US F-4 Phantom. Very capable plane, doesn't have, like, a safety record-wise. People are like, well, it doesn't have a gun. It has a wide turn radius. But other than that, this thing's awesome. Like, okay. So they take off, and they're flying basically within a few minutes of taking off. Oh, we have a major snowstorm coming up. The pilot, the, the group leader says, hey, let's ascend to 12,000 feet. Let's get above the storm. Let's do that. Air traffic control is going, no, 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 no. We have too much commercial traffic. Don't do it. Just turn around and come back. Okay. Two of the, the two planes turn back. Dean Paul Martin, for, Dean Paul, for some reason, doesn't get the communication. I don't know if everyone's trying to talk at the same time. And he keeps going forward. Mm. And so, tragically, he says, oh, my God, there's a storm. He tries to dive on it. They, they record a, a steep dive, and then he hits the sand... Um, uh, what was it called? Let's see. It's the, I think I have it right here. The name of the mountain. Mm. It's the it is the San Bernardino Range. It's San San Diego, uh, uh, Diego Reno. I, I butchered it, but anyway, <laughs> our, our locals know what it is. So it's in the San Bernardino Range. It at around fifty five hundred feet, his plane slams in, mm. and he's and and he's lost. Neither one ejected. And when they released the transcript from the air traffic control flight, the air traffic control is like, hey, you got to change course, change course. No response from either Ortiz or, or Martin. And neither one tried to eject. Hmm. They were, in 19 years, he's been flying. Hmm. 
And they said, well, maybe it was vertigo, but he was trained to fly with with uh, with with instruments if mm-hmm. you if you can't go line of sight. Yeah, like yeah. Like you're talking about with, uh, JFK Jr. Yeah. And that didn't happen. And it, it's just strange that no one ejected. They crashed. And so when they tried to, to this to this date, the U.S. Air Force hasn't re- released the official accident report. Toxicology report was clean. They said maybe he had vertigo. But a guy who's that trained, why would that happen? So it, it turns out when they try to investigate this thing later on, between uh, Palm Springs and... Uh, I forgot what's what's the name of this thing. It's um, it's a path from um. Uh, anyway, oh yeah, from Palm Springs to Riverside, okay. and there's two major mountains, San Giorgiorno on the right, which is the higher one, and then there's a uh, San uh, Mount San Jacinto on the south side. Giorgiorno has a body count. Because it's eleven thousand five hundred feet, mm. so people, for some reason, if you know this is the case, I don't know why no one ever takes a look at it. So, nineteen fifty-two, thirteen people died when the DC three crashed at eleven thousand five hundred feet at the summit. One month later, a U.S. Marine copter to go retrieve the bodies crashes while trying to land near the wreckage. Wow. Everyone's lost there. Nineteen fifty-six, a U.S. Air Force four people die when the, their TB twenty-five Mitchell crashed on the way to the Norton Air Force Base. Then in nineteen seventy-seven, this part. Sinatra's mother, her best friend, and both co-pilots crash and die when they went to go see, when they were on their way to go see Sinatra perform in, in Vegas at Caesars. Oh wow. wow! Sinatra's mother and her best friend pass away. Wow! On this 1977. Wow! All while flying along this range. And now, <clears throat> what uh, for, for Dean Paul Martin? You know, he, he had well, tragically he left a son behind, Alexander. He married Dorothy Hamill. Oh, wow. That was the second marriage. His first marriage was to Olivia Hussey. Oh, Hussey, you might know that from, she's from Romeo and Juliet, the, mm-hmm. the old classic one. And Yeah, so uh, what year did that plane crash happen? 1987. 87. So, yeah, I was while you were talking, I, I out of curiosity, I looked on my phone to find out when Dean Martin passed away, and he, he died in 1995. So, you know, to outlive your son and to lose a he son did, that way had and, been devastating and, right. and you're absolutely spot on because he did an interview with an australian uh, entertainment team uh, news team and they said he'd, he he was broken he said you know he came you know he was very happy he says one of the nicest interviews i've ever had done for it. but yeah it it, it broke him mm. and you outlive your kid because and dean paul martin i mean they they he said him and his wife were fatalists and they said you know there's a time and place i guess everyone has to go at some point but he mm. kind of learned how to cope with it you know still performed and he had Alexander, his grandchild. So yeah. that's kind of how they kind of coped up with that. But it was just strange that, you know, there was heavy comm traffic. Why was no, uh, and again, this is the, I didn't want to go down conspiracy theory. Why no official accident report? And they only had released the transcripts. And how, my thing is, why didn't they eject? How did they not know? How come no, there's no chatter from them? Yeah. Like, what's going on? This guy's an experienced 19-year pilot. Everyone says he's capable. He wasn't going through a tough time. Yeah, yeah. At, you know, at least not that we know of, nothing that's publicly. He wasn't, toxicology reports were clean. The plane didn't malfunction. The only thing that comes to mind, and, and this sounds very similar to a plane crash I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but, you know, there's a snow squall, limited visibility. Who knows if... You know, he thinks he's at a certain altitude and all of a sudden there's a mountain right there in front of you and you don't even have time. You know, I don't know if these planes are equipped with that that audio alert, but I've listened to uh, plane crash, you know, uh, uh, recordings yeah. and you always hear that pull up, yeah. pull up, pull and up. And this They're, had that. Yeah. The F-4 Phantom was, and because he was not, a, it wasn't a solo flight. Yeah. He had a co-pilot. Yeah. Both were co- very competent in it. And it was a wing. There were two other planes. They both turned. Yeah. They both went, were turned back to base. And he just kept going. And Yeah. I, I wonder if it may have been a case of what well, you said that the investigation said that there is no, like, maintenance problems. But I wonder if there was some sort of, like, loss of power or not loss of power, loss of communication or something to the point where somebody who was responsible found out about it and put the kibosh on it because and you know what? they we, would have been... We might, and again, we're entering, liable for we're entering theory, uh, obviously, because yeah. the plane was, you know, when they inspected the record, said, oh, the plane worked fine. There was no, 
I don't yeah. know how we're looking at wreckage, but it's it's one of those strange things. A, a capable pilot, no foul play suspected, yet how come, okay, you're, he's not responding. There's no chatter from Mr. Ortiz, the co-pilot. Yeah. Now, the, another thing that comes to mind, one of the little tidbits that I read while investigating the uh, JFK Jr. plane crash is they said when they retrieved the uh, plane from the, the bottom of the, the ocean there, they found that the radio settings were on the wrong frequencies. And so, you know, that could be a factor too. Like maybe he's on the wrong frequency and, and they're like, how come we're not hearing back from this guy? And he's probably never hearing them to begin with. So there's that speculation on my part. But, and that's yeah. that, that's valid, but they all have to be in communication when they take off and fly. Yeah, yeah, so they, yeah. unless at some point he says, what are you doing? What are you doing, Dino? I want to change the channel and try to get the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh. this is one of those days, and it was a tragic loss because this, you know, I didn't know at the time when I was a kid, I was watching, you know, I was like, hey, it's D this guy, Misfits of Science, it's a great show. And yeah. anyone gets a chance, Google it. It was fantastic. The theme huh. song gets stuck in your head. Yeah, yeah. But tragic loss. Yeah. All right. Andrew, what you got? All right. I got a local connection. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, I know you're probably, you're probably don't, not super familiar with her music, but you remember Aaliyah? Yes, Andrew. Yes. I'm quite okay. familiar with Aaliyah. Yes. Okay. I, 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 had to, I, I, I had am to older than you. I had to ask. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but anyway, um, she grew up or was born in uh, New York City, and then her and her family moved here to yeah, Detroit yeah. when she was five. Uh, she was a brilliant student, went to the, the Detroit High School for Fine and Performing Arts, where she had a 4.0 the whole time. And, yeah. Um, her un- She was real, not blood blood related but her aunt was um Gladys Knight yeah. who kind of wow. took her under her wing when she wing when she realized how talented she was and she performed with Gladys Knight out in Las Vegas so she got a hit of stardom very young and um got involved in the the music industry very young and just started making music now unfortunately she crossed paths with R Kelly well and <laughs> So, apparently they they had a secret marriage. She was only wow, I didn't hear that. She was only fifteen. He was twenty seven, <sighs> and apparently, he he made her get married because apparently it's a rumor that she, she got pregnant. Wow! And they had to forge like the the papers and everything saying she was eighteen. Then her parents found out, and then the next year, you know, they took like legal action and, and legal action. And had it annulled, but anyway. So, despite that, despite being <laughs> having that that uh, interaction wow. with R. Kelly, at, I would expect more from R. Kelly. <laughs> despite that, that, that she amazing. quickly rose through the ranks, and she was still a teenager. And she was, I mean, it's like Britney Spears, but just like maybe two years before Britney Spears, I think. But anyway, I uh, mean, her, her career reminds me of James Dean. Cut off way too oh, short. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. she was in a couple movies. I, didn't, I haven't seen either one of them. Um, they weren't. Oh, I mean, look, Queen of the Damned. Queen, uh, Queen was, of the Damned was she was phenomenal. I mean, the movie itself had other issues, but her performance was great in that. And then she did an action action flick with Jet Li, and I'll always be. Yeah, well, was it was it Romeo Must Die? Was yeah. is that the one? <laughs> okay, um, but her her music was very catchy. I I feel like if okay, so I'll I'll, I'll get to what what really happened. She was, <laughs> Um, about two or three weeks before nine eleven, she was fil- filming a music video in, I, th- I believe, it was the Bahamas, somewhere, somewhere, okay. somewhere off the coast of Florida, and they were flying back, in a little tiny, uh, it was either a seven or eight person plane, but it had one more person than it was supposed to have, so it either had eight or nine people. Um, it was overloaded. The pilot ap- apparently had uh, alcohol and uh, I think it was cocaine in his system. Oh, jeez. And mm. she herself, the story goes that she was afraid to get on the plane. And she refused to get on the plane because I think she knew like it was overloaded. So someone gave her some sort of uh, antidepressant or so- some sort of sedative. Mm. And she passed out. And then they p- physically put her on the plane. And wow. then... About 200 feet after it left the runway, it just went immediately went down. Wow. That fast. Wow. 
and everyone, on, everyone on board killed. Wow. That's yeah. see now you could take that at, at face level, at face value, and say, okay, you know, she was you didn't want to get on that flight, and they said, hey, this will here, this will calm you down. You get on there. Or if I go down the the conspiracy hole, you know, this is, <laughs> my God, this is like, I can't believe this is it. They, so they, they essentially drugged her. To get her on the flight. So Not like what they did with uh, BA on the A-team. Yeah. yeah. They had to knock him out and, and get him on a plane. And I didn't get in, into all the details of what happened after that, but her family tried to sue. I think it was the aircraft operator company. Uh, you know, for some sort of negligence. Yeah. Um, and then I, I guess whoever was involved with giving her the medication obviously was probably killed on the plane too. So they, right, right. they couldn't take legal action against that. But yeah. it wasn't Michael Jackson's doctor, was it? <laughs> or Bill Cosby. Jeez. <laughs> now, I, I hate to admit this, but I played a minor role in Aaliyah's death. And it, it's a long story. Whoa. So Way to bury the lead, Joe. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, so here's what happened. So uh, back in 1989, uh, my my birthday falls on August 26, and my mom passed away on August 22nd. And she was in a hospice, and I'm like, "Don't die on my birthday! Don't die on my birthday! Don't die on my birthday!" And uh, and she died four days before my birthday. And so I had kind of this phobia, like I don't want a major national day of mourning to occur on my birthday and as time went on i started looking at like notable deaths uh elvis died in august marilyn monroe died in august princess diana died in august and i started noticing like these notable celebrity deaths in and around my birthday and i'm like don't die on my birthday and it became a sort of a, a ongoing joke with friends and family and so with my birthday falling on August 26, my sister calls me up. And she's like, I got goosebumps when I heard. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, Aaliyah died today, which was August 25th, yep, the day, day before. before my birthday. And now whenever my birthday gets closer within, you know, the few weeks before, week or so after, if a celebrity dies, I'll get a text from a buddy going, you killed so-and-so. Um, <laughs> this year, 2023... Bob Barker died on my birthday. Oh, I was angry. And I had mentioned it. I had predicted it like a few <laughs> days before. My buddy was like, so who's going to die on your birthday? And I'm like, I don't know. Bob Barker's getting up there. And he died on my birthday. So I take some responsibility for Aaliyah's death. Yeah. Joe, you're, no, you're never going to get anyone to be interviewed on August. <laughs> They're going to avoid you like the plague. But it's eerie almost. Yeah, when, that when, is. When's your birthday, Nick? Oh, mine's in May. We're fine. Okay. Yours is next because mine's in July. So I predict uh, Jimmy Carter will die on your birthday. Yeah, I mean, look, I, it might it might be January. <laughs> that's, that's, I, I feel bad. I mean, that that that's hospice right there. But Aaliyah, she had, you know, I wasn't really a big fan of the uh, her later music. It's fine. It's 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 for club music. It works well. Yeah, yeah. She performed probably one. Her natural talent was amazing. She she got I think it was an Oscar nomination. For Journey to the Past, for the song in the film Anastasia, the animated film. Oh, I did. Yeah, I didn't she. Know. Yeah, it's. It, it, if you ever get a chance to listen to it, she did just natural vocals. It was amazing. I mean, they made a music video later on and didn't really have to do a lot in it, but her natural vocals on that, she she was phenomenal. Hmm. And I, I found out fairly recently that. Do, 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 you, are you guys familiar with the the Marvin Gaye song "Got to Give It Up"? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She covered that, and and. I listened to it. I'm like, this is so cool. Yeah. It's like a like a mid to late 90s yeah. spin on what he did in the early 70s. And it's well, that it's funny you mention that because Marvin Gaye's estate sued Robin Thicke yeah. because yeah. he borrowed heavily from that uh, song for Blurred, Blurred, Lines. Blurred, Lines. Blurred Lines. And yes. he lost the lawsuit. He They, they like won the judgment against yep. him. So, yep. yeah. yeah, because Blurred Lines was just, oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, you're just showing crimes. Are, are all of them over 18, Robin? <laughs> Doesn't look like that on the video. My God, that's there. That's the that's the court evidence right there. I uh, I prefer Weird Al's cover of Blurred Lines called Word Crimes. And if you've <laughs> never heard it. It's brilliant. It's absolutely genius. He hasn't lost his touch, Weird Al. Yeah. All right, are you done with Aaliyah? Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have much much 
to say, but um, she was only 22. Uh, yeah. That's one of those. Wasn't she, was <laughs> was there some Matrix, was, was she being tapped to be in the Matrix or something like that? I heard a rumor about that she was going to be involved in the Matrix franchise. Possibly. Hmm. I didn't come across that, but I mean. I mean, that could have been awesome. She, she was a triple threat. You'd see, you see oh, yeah. her dance in her videos. She was absolutely gorgeous. Hmm. My God. Wow. And with, if this wouldn't have happened, she would have been, she would have gone on to be the next, yeah. you know, whatever. Mariah Carey, Madonna. I can only hope that she was unconscious when the accident happened. So she did. Yeah. I, suffer. yeah. Yeah. Most, I mean, look, I would it, say it, you said likely. within, they were only at 200 feet. So just right yeah. after takeoff. Some, so, yeah. So, yeah. Something like, extremely fast hmm. yeah all right my next story uh has a lot of similarities with the uh the uh the story that you told about uh, uh dean martin's son uh it happened in a similar area i don't think it's the same mountain range um but twa flight three originated in new york and was destined for burbank california and had a couple of stopovers, including a refueling stop in Las Vegas. And on January 16, 1942, at uh, 7.30 uh, PST, 15 minutes after takeoff from the Las Vegas airport, uh, the plane crashed into a cliff on Potosi Mountain, P-O-T-O-S-I. Uh, 22 people in total were killed, including Carol Lombard, um, who we may have mentioned on a past uh, podcast as a, a blonde bombshell. She was one of the most beautiful women in Hollywood at that time with the most incredible eyes. Uh, she was married to Clark Gable at the time and had been previously married to William Powell. And uh, Lombard's mother was on the plane. Uh, three crew members and a number of members of the military were all on the plane. Uh, so on the morning of J January 16, 1942, uh, she got on board the plane in Indianapolis as her war bond tour was winding down and she had raised over $2 million in war bonds on her tour. Um, from what I understand, a lot of wow. it was on the road and she was just getting tired of the road. And so she wanted to fly home to California to be with Clark Gable. Um, before leaving Indianapolis, uh, she was her and her party were asked to leave the airplane uh, to make room for 15 U.S. Army Air Corps personnel, but she insisted on flying on the plane, and so other passengers gave up their seats so that Carol Lombard could fly on the plane. There's fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so they briefly landed in Las Vegas, refueled. Uh, took off from uh, Las Vegas and was almost seven miles off course um, before crashing into the mountain. Uh, looking back and investigating the crash, what experts determined is that the pilots of the plane had flown between Vegas and nearby cities many, many times, um, and they had flown out of Boulder City far more times than they had flying out of Las Vegas. They may have followed uh, the instrumentation and, and compass headings, having think thinking like, you know how sometimes you're driving and you, you're on autopilot. That's kind of what these pilots were. And they had set their course as if they were flying out of Boulder instead of Vegas. Ah. And they were flying at an altitude which would not have cleared the mountain range. And so they just, oh. thinking they were just on autopilot, they flew directly into a mountain and everybody was killed. Uh, she was buried at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale. And even though Clark, Clark Gable, who had been despondent after her death, and had joined the military, fought in the war effort after she had passed away because she had tried to encourage him to do that. Uh, he had since, since her death remarried twice, but in the end, when his time came in 1960, he was interred uh, beside Carol Lombard uh, at Forest Lawn. Um, something I just learned recently, which absolutely blew my mind, is that hikers who hiked that mountain range found the wreckage and the debris scattered all over the mountain and it's still there to this day really 
And I don't know if you would <laughs> want to call it a souvenir or whatever. I don't think I could do that. Mm. I don't think I could grab the wheel of the plane and go, look what I got. To me, that's a grave site, but the wreckage is there. And some hikers discovered it and photographed it and showed all the pieces of the wreckage still on that mountainside today. See, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is like with the accident report from the U.S. Air Force regarding Dean. How long has it been? Can we get someone, if hikers can make it up there, can we get someone there and just take care of the wreckage for God's Apparently sake? not. Apparently, you know, being on a mountain range, I guess it would just be cost prohibitive. It kind of reminds me, of, there's a there's a road in L.A., uh, you know, it has the nickname Dead Man's Curve or whatever. And I remember seeing some uh, explorers go down to the wooded area off Dead Man's Curve and found car after car after car that had flown off the road and they would retrieve the bodies and leave the cars because it just wasn't feasible to retrieve the car. So uh, I, I don't know if it's Mulholland Drive. I want to say it's Mulholland Drive, but I'm not positive. But sometimes in a case of a remote access, they do what they can to retrieve the bodies and they leave the wreckage there. I understand if it's... The abyss, the Marianas Trench, the, <laughs> the Himalayas. Titanic. You know, yeah. this is not some, or Mars, the moon, if yeah. you would. This is not so difficult in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I can't help but wonder if there are people somewhere here in this country that have like a shadow box hanging on their wall. And you go, what's what's that twisted metal in there? Well, you're not going to believe this, but <laughs> I climbed up uh, Mount Potosi and grabbed some pieces of Carol Lombard's wreckage. I mean, you got to think that's out there somewhere. Oh, yeah, well, well, it's not like I, I'm not going to believe it. I don't want to believe it, Frank, because I think that's creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's psychotic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to, like, pay your respects at a gravesite, but to pick up something and carry it home. That's pretty crazy. But yeah, I was so shocked. Yeah. Yeah. I was so shocked to see that the wreckage is still up there and uh, pretty wild. All right. So that's my second story. Uh, Maginos Pete, you got another one. Yeah. For mine, it's James Horner, the legendary composer for anyone out there listening. If there's a Mount Rushmore in my Mount Rushmore of composers, it's obviously John Williams. Thank you. John Williams. There's Howard Shore, because he could have just done Lord of the Rings, and I'd love him forever. And then there's James Horner. James Horner, I I can't possibly list. We, there'd be an entire different podcast for that. Am I wrong in saying that he contributed to the Titanic soundtrack? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. You're not wrong. Won an Oscar, won two Oscars for, for that. In AFI's top 100, uh, top 25 film scores, he has five of them. Mm. The man accounts for 20, 20% of it. Think of stuff like from the Page Master, Aliens, Commando. This is all early stuff before yeah. we get to the heavy hitter stuff. A Avatar, uh, Titanic, The Amazing Spider-Man with Andrew Garfield. He did like the first one, didn't like the second one, said I wasn't going to do it because it was kind of shit. <laughs> and, was, and then Hans Zimmer came up and, and picked up and took over. Not, not an integration of Hans Zimmer. I love him too. But mm -hmm. James Horner is one of those amazing... Uh, it's like the it's like the score to your life. As, or you can you can remember those movies when you're where you are when you're watching the ones that stick with you. You can remember the soundtracks that go with it. it kind of it becomes part of who you are. The memories that are associated with it. And so he was an avid pilot, and he flew on June twenty second, twenty fifteen. He was flying a the the plane is called a short Tucano. It's a single engine plane. Why with the single engines? I'm sorry if I'm getting animated on this, but it's a single engine. You have one engine. If it goes, you're gone, yeah. people. Always fly two. If you're out there and you're a celebrity, for Christ's sake, get two engines, for God. <laughs> Just get two. Give yourself a chance. Anyway, so he was flying. He, he took off. He was going for a flight, and witnesses said that he flew over two houses, and they were saying, well, we could see the plane. And apparently, according to the NTSB, he was maybe five to 700 feet above mm. his height. So that's way too low, obviously, if you're flying. And he was flying through a, uh, the, the canyon. And these people said he was making turns. Toxicology report came in. He had several drugs in him. And he was oh, from barbiturates to codeine. And his wife said, you know, well, he professed that he had Asperger's. That won't play a role in when it comes to flying unless, you know, you're compromised. Your yeah. faculties are compromised. But why? Mm. 
This is a senseless, tragic death. Here, so is you know, he showboating, basically? And, just... and this is what people were saying. Like, the plane was taking turns. It looked wow. like he was almost, like, kind of flying through the canyon. I don't know if he was in ma- trying to... If he had his, it'd be weird if he had his own soundtrack blasting, yeah, yeah, score blasting, and he was flying through there. But it seemed reckless. It so seemed what did dangerous. he? What did he eventually contact? What did he run into? Oh, the ground. So yeah, he it, just was, it was the side of the mountain. It was, it, wow. it was probably the side of the canyons. Yeah, yeah. And so, wow, it's it's a, a senseless loss. Didn't you, there was no major weather factor in this. This was pure pilot error. Yeah, and you know if you go, apparently his wife said from his house he had a bunch of automatons in there because he loved it. He loved machines. He loved the way they worked. He, like I said, it's it was part of what made him tick. It helped him with his creative process, and just someone taken way too early. Wow. And you think about their work, his work, all the soundtracks that he's committed, he's given. Yeah. The, you know what that story reminds me of? I don't want to. I don't want to give out too much information here because it was a local accident, and I I don't want anyone to connect the dots, but, uh, I once knew a police officer, uh, who attended a a fraternal order of police gathering where there were food and alcohol on the premises. And, uh, two of the police officers kind of staggered out of the lodge there. And one of them turned to the other and said, I'm a pilot. And, uh, you want to get on the plane? And the other guy was like, sure. Both of them were in no condition to drive, let alone go up in a plane. Uh, They made their way to whatever airport housed the airplane, boarded the airplane, got it airborne and said, you know, what would be funny. Let's buzz the fraternal order of police lodge. So they, they found the street. I think it was mound road aligned themselves up with Mound Road, looking visually for the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge, came in low, traffic said, they look up, there's a plane flying down Mound Road. What they didn't account for was the next to the lodge there was an emergency dispatch with a large radio antenna. They clipped the antenna, barely missed the hall where the party was taking place, which would have resulted in mass casualties of police officers, uh, hit the pavement, slid up a drive into a garage. The engine (laughs) of the plane uh, went through the back of the garage. They found it in the backyard of the home. So now all of a sudden, all the police come running out and go, holy cow, a plane just crashed outside. And as they investigate, they find it was two of their own who had just left the party. So it, your story kind of reminded me of, you know, to get into a plane and act like idiots is not a, a good thing. That is a recipe for disaster. It, and I, I, I can't, I can't fathom it. Look, I guess all these, I don't know about the cops, but you know, James Horner, celebrity, you know, JFK Jr. Celebrity. Carol Lombard, celebrity. I, I, I gave, I just, when the, early in the show, we just ran through a list of, John Travolta owned a Boeing 747. Yeah. I mean, the man can fly, you know, a lot of these he guys. He could land on his property, if I remember in correctly. In Ocala, Florida. I, I he saw, has a yeah. runway. He has yeah. two private runways. <laughs> That's wild to me. I mean, and, well. you know, Ford. Ford can do the same thing. Steven Spielberg, uh, uh, Brad Pitt, yeah. all these, Clint Eastwood, all these guys are, Kurt Russell, in executive decision in the 1996 film, he could actually fly that. He wanted wow. to be in the cockpit because he said, hey, I'm, I'm a pilot. I can do this. Yeah. So you don't even have to coach me. I got this. Man. That's so wild. They, they can all fly. I just wish they'd, you know, get two engines, get yeah, more right, than one engine, right. and fly first yeah. class, for God's sakes. Yeah. I don't want to be bothered. Really, no one will bother you. Yeah. Andrew, we have a little over 10 minutes left. Uh, you got okay. another story? I have another local connection. This has to do with a different labor leader uh, than the one that, Used to live about a mile from here, mm-hmm. Walter Ruther. So, all right, he, he helped start the UAW, uh, like in the yes. early days, like helped organize those first strikes, like the sit down. Him and his brothers, they were, they were involved with uh, with labor, and they helped organize like the sit down strikes up in uh, Flint, and just really got things moving. And he was just a a, 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 lot, a lifelong liberal. Um, I'll just give you a few things on on what he uh, tried to accomplish. Um, 
he helped negotiate a prisoner exchange uh, after the Bay, Bay of Pigs invasion with Cuba. Oh wow! Oh, wow. Yeah, so he he was he was buddies with with with, Ken, with Kennedy. Wow! Uh, he was instrumental in creating the Peace Corps, marshaling support for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 65, Medicare, Medicaid, and the Fair Housing Act. Uh, and also been met with Johnson for the Great Society and the War on Poverty. And of course, the Republicans hated him. Oh yeah, uh, Barry Goldwater said um, that Ruther was more dangerous to our country than Sputnik or anything the Soviet Russia might do. I was I was wondering <laughs> yeah. when they were going to say. Were, were I'm surprised gonna, he was no, accused of communism. Yeah, there yeah. you go. All right, the, the Red Scare. Oh, yeah, I'm sure John so, Wayne hated him. Yeah, oh yeah. Luckily, he was spared. I mean, there were there were some possible attempts on his life. Oh wow. yeah, but. Um, yeah, so so he was born uh, uh, in uh, West Virginia, not too far from where my grandfather was born in rural West Virginia. Came to Detroit to work in the factories, just like my grandpa. But this was years before my grandpa, because uh, Ruther was born in 1907. Um, anyway, um, yes. So I'll just make this short. He helped with uh, the big three get organized. All three companies, uh, wow. Ford was the last one because Henry Ford was yeah. really against unions and was going to do everything he could so, to not let, let the unions uh, organize at Ford. Uh, he saw the writing on the wall that the U.S. would probably be dragged into World War II. So in 1940, a year before, he wrote a letter to Roosevelt saying, we have all this industrial capacity in Detroit. If you need it, we can put out, and he quoted, we can put out, 500 planes a day, mm. like oh, yeah. military planes. So he was instrumental in getting the arsenal. Wow. of. I mean, this guy, he he helped a lot. Mm. He did a lot. So anyway, after the war ended, about eight, eight, six to eight months after the war ended, in uh, early 46, he became the president of, of the UAW. So, of course, at that time, you know, it's gonna, it might put a target on your back if, if there are, you know, some – some right wingers in the in the government, but even before that, um, in nineteen thirty eight, apparently two masked gunmen attempted to abduct Ruther at a party that he was hosting. Mm. But however, one guest managed to flee and alert the authorities, leading to their arrest. At the trial, the defense argued that the that Ruther staged the entire event as a publicity stunt. However, links between the gunmen and this guy named Harry Bennett who was a known union-busting enemy of the UAW, they were not even, these facts weren't even disclosed to the jury. Mm. So anyway, wow. but and 10 years later, so someone tried to assassinate him with a double bear shotgun through uh, his uh, front window of his house. Yeah. And he had just turned to his wife and it hit him in the shoulder instead of in the chest and he wow. survived. Wow, that's wild. So... Um, the man didn't have any security guards. Uh, later on, after after that, he did. Yeah. Okay, so um, they they asked uh, the attorney general at the time asked J. Edgar Hoover, and I'm not going to say a word. That's uh, in case they're listening. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, a word a word that that's mentioned here, but he, he said. <laughs> He wanted the FBI to investigate, and they refused to. Huh. And it, and J. Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover said in response, I'm not going to send the FBI every time some N-word woman gets raped. Woo! Like say, wow. saying that Ruther was trash, that he wasn't worth uh, investigating. Wow. So that in and of itself. No, that fits for Hoover. That, oh, I mean. What a piece of garbage. So that right there tells you someone yeah. had their eyes on him. Mm. Oh yeah, this guy sounded yeah. like he had plenty, oh, yeah. plenty of enemies. Oh, the FBI had files on everybody. Thir Thirteen months after this, his brother Victor, who was also big in the labor movement, was also was almost killed by a similar shooting from also a double barrel shotgun. <laughs> Could be the same shotgun. Um, I mean, what is with this obsession with shotguns? And, it used to be called a rifle, and also, also shot through his living room window. Um, just a flair for the dramatics here, guys. And he said the attack on me was a way of serving a notice to my brother Walter. So, mm. yeah. Anyway, 
So he and his wife were, were traveling from, I believe they left from Detroit and were going up to, there's a small airport just south of Mackinac City called uh, Palston. Okay. And up in that area, there's uh, a, a UAW owned like retreat. Sure. Uh, it's called uh, Black Lake. So they were flying up there late at night. During rain and fog. May I ask what type of plane? Do I even want to know what type of plane this was? Uh, a chartered Learjet 23, which I'm I'm not. Well, there from, you go. That's more than one engine. So that, okay, yeah. And, and this was uh, May of 1970. So I'd imagine it, was, it wasn't a little, it wasn't tiny. The weather stuff still, you know, red flaggy, but. Okay, so they went down and it was um, his wife, May. An architect named Oscar Stonerov, their bodyguard, and the pilot and co-pilot. So that's what five, five, six people. Um, so the NTSB did, of course, did a, a investigation. Sure, they found that the planes is it ultimate, ultimate, Ult- uh, the ultimate, altimeter, the altimeter, yeah. yeah, was missing parts. Some incorrect parts were installed. One of the parts had been installed upside down. Leading to some to speculate that sabotage. That yeah, that it was. Uh, you take away the altimeter, then the altimeter. You don't and, know. What. <laughs> and then it says Ruther had been subjected earlier to two a- attempted assassinations, and a similar near crash in a small plane the year earlier. Mm. But I didn't get all the details on that one the year earlier. Wow. And uh, a journalist later wrote. Ruther's demise appears as part of a truncation of liberal and radical leadership that included the deaths of four national figures. Wow. John F. Kennedy, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, and Robert Kennedy. Wow. Yeah. If you're going to take any hard <laughs> progress, I'll take them out like that. So this you're, was two, this was two years after uh, RFK and um, MLK. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you're a car guy. Drive. Just drive, man. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I so, had to I had to look this yeah. up. Do you guys know off the top of your head which uh, freeway is known as the Walter Ruther? Yeah, Six, I used six ninety six. Six ninety six. Yeah, yeah. That was my guess. And it was, was it was ninety six. It was being built right around that time that he died, and mm. like well, in portions. Yeah, but yeah. It's probably still being built. Today. It's still being built. <laughs> We're by two seventy five. Yeah. Oh, what a mess! But the weirdest already. thing is, no one's ever named Hoffa. <laughs> like there's no high which I wonder which of the eyes was going to be named after Hoffa. Whatever one he's buried under, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> watch it be seventy five. There's new there's new speculation. What did I just see recently that more? There's more. Someone says, oh, he, Hoffa's buried here. So I don't know. They've done so many digs. Hey, you know they're supposed to elevate uh, three seventy five around the east east side of downtown because right now it's like below grade. Yeah, yeah. And so I wonder if they're going to uncover anything mm. when oh, they geez. dig all that up and bring it up. Above, above they grade. might, <laughs> but if there's one thing I learned from this "Death from Above" episode, the John F. Kennedy stuff, just you know, like you said, you started me off on this thing about t- just check the planes, people. You're rich, you're wealthy, fly yeah, yeah. first class, fly with others. Yeah, make sure you fly in a plane. You're tempting that, fate. Yeah, it seems like these type of things don't happen as often, though. I mean, with with big like regulations and. Advances, yeah. obviously, oh, no. and technology, and I, I'm, I, I'm super concerned about traveling right now. Now we're talking about 2023 for anyone that's listening. Really? Yeah. But, well, that Iceland uh, 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 volcano, volcano. Iceland yeah. is going to erupt again. There's another one's going to erupt, <laughs> so that's going to cause all sorts of problems. But then, the they thankfully averted a government shutdown. Yes, we still have those, and because <laughs> yeah. that was going to have with Thanksgiving traffic. I don't want, you know, air traffic controllers and, and, and anyone at the airport be like, yeah, I've been working without a paycheck for the last 30, right, exactly. 30 days. I don't need they're, that. They're going to quit yeah. and find a, a job somewhere else, <laughs> and then they're not going to have anyone to take the spots. Uh, I kind of want to wrap up on uh, this story. Again, we've touched on it before. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned it earlier. Um, Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and the uh, Big Bopper, uh, they were touring the country as part of the Winter Dance Party Tour which began in Milwaukee on January 23rd, 1959. Now you say, don't fly, don't fly. Well, they were traveling the country by bus, an unheated bus, which led to frostbite on, on their drummer. And they were heading, uh, they were going to leave one location, head to another location. Buddy Holly was sick of riding around by bus. And so he chartered a plane. 
Uh, so they performed at the Surf Ballroom in Clear Lake, Iowa. And then as they gathered uh, near the plane to figure out who was going to go to their next stop, uh, where they can get in early, relax, get some laundry done. Uh, they had the four people uh, that were going to go on it, but then there was that uh, famous coin toss you may have heard. Uh, one of the band members, Tommy Alsup, A-L-L-S-U-P, he was a guitar player. Uh, him and Richie Valens flipped a coin, and Richie Valens won the coin toss, and said, well, this is the first thing I've ever won. Uh, so he won Alsup's seat. Waylon Jennings voluntarily gave up his seat to the big bopper who had the flu and was complaining about the conditions of riding on this freezing, freezing bus. And he was a large man. Uh, so that's how the passengers were selected on this plane. So pilot Roger Peterson took off in bad weather again, and here's a recurring theme, was not certified to fly by instruments. Uh, witnesses said they saw the plane get airborne and then it looked like it had dipped below the horizon. Like, huh, it got behind the, the horizon pretty quickly when in reality it just crashed into a cornfield uh, shortly after 1 a.m. on February 3rd, 1959. Uh, the three musicians on board were all ejected. Um, Big Bopper was found like 40 yards away from the, the wreckage where the other two were found close to the uh, wreckage. Uh, and here's another weird coincidence. Holly was only uh, 22 years old, just like you said Aaliyah was. Wow. Um, and that is known as the day the music died and one of the most famous uh, plane crashes uh, in U.S. history, I would imagine. Uh, here's another uh, little tidbit I only recently learned. I don't think I mentioned this when we talked about it on our music podcast, but um, a few months after the crash, which you know happened in wintertime, the farmer who owned the property was working the fields and was near the crash site and dug up uh, some artifacts from the, the crash site, including a, a pair of thick black framed glasses <laughs> that uh, he had unearthed uh, at the crash site, very similar to what I'm wearing right now. Those were Buddy Holly's famous uh, glasses. The lenses were busted out of them. Uh, he placed them in an envelope and they were left in storage. People were unaware until 1980 <laughs> when someone opened up a manila envelope and they saw whatever buddy's real name was, I forget what his real name was, but it was on uh, the manila envelope. And when he emptied the contents, he sees the glass. He's like, are these buddy Holly's glasses who've been sitting in a filing cabinet? Uh, so eventually they were given to his widow. And, um, after there was, I guess a court decision in 1981. And then she eventually donated them to the buddy Holly center in Lubbock, Texas. So, they are on display. You can visit them today. So I thought maybe they might be in the Smithsonian, but no, they're in his own personal museum. Yeah, okay. yeah. So imagine that. Imagine digging something like that out of the dirt and going, these are Buddy Holly's glasses. And had he not found them, who knows who would have found them years later, if they ever would have been found. But what a remarkable find in that now they're on display. So... So that's our last uh, plane crash story. Do you guys have anything you want to add? No, 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 no this I'm is, good. Uh, been pretty eye opening. Do you want to? Do you want to break the news to our listeners that uh, we're going to be winding down the Hollywood Crime Scene podcast? Yeah, yeah. Look, it, it has been a wonderful year and a half. Yeah, you want to say about that, year and a half. And uh, done, since yeah. we started this, uh, we started this podcast of Hollywood Crime Scene and. Look, it's a wonderful topic, but I feel like there's only so much you can cover on something like this. But we are not going to be leaving, leaving. We're going to be altering the topics. Yeah, we'll close out the year. We got a couple yeah. more uh, things in mind. One thing I was thinking as our final podcast, which we could probably do in December, is sort of a look back at some of our favorite topics, favorite themes, sure. that sort of thing. And wind down on that. And then we'll come back with something brand new in January. Uh, we're talking about continuing the Hollywood theme, maybe movie theme or uh, Hollywood landmarks or something like that. But yeah. uh, we'll we'll collaborate. We'll come up with something new for our listeners. 
Um, but yeah, enjoy our last few Hollywood, uh, Hollywood crime scene, uh, podcast episodes, uh, in 2023. And we'll be back with something brand new in 2024. 2024. So, all right. All right. So guys, uh, another good one. And we will, uh, see you in two weeks with our next episode of Hollywood crime scene.